man. There is a revival going on right now, uh, and it usually starts at the colleges. And we're going we're gonna to find out why revival happens. I can tell you this. I can tell you why revival tarries and why it does not happen. And it has nothing to do with God. <laughs> it has zero to do with God. It has everything to do with us. Revival doesn't happen because we don't want revival. That's a true statement. When the people want to be revived, God revives us. That's what he does. He answers our prayers. So if God answers our prayers, then how many people are praying for revival? How many people, watch this, think that they're just fine? That is a bigger problem. I was talking to my wife about it, and we're going to talk about it today. I'm not going to prolong it today, amen, but I want us to, to get this. You know, We're going to talk about not just revival. Revival happens when you are revived. I'm going to say that again. I hope you all are taking notes. This is If you assume that you know it already, that's the problem. I want you to take good notes on what I'm saying to you. A revival is when is what everybody wants to be a part of. When God's spirit move like moves like never before, when when we see miracles and great things, everybody wants the miracle signs and wonders. That's what everybody says. That is really revival, but it does not and cannot happen until all of us want to be revived, brought back or brought to the place that we need to be. Here's the secret I want you to know. None of us, none of us, me, everybody on here, none of us are where we're supposed to be. That is the secret. None of us are. But watch this. It's only some of us that's not content. <laughs> All right. If if you it's the question is not whether or not we are where we're supposed to be. None of us are. How many of y'all can say that I, I know for a fact I'm all that God wanted me to be? No, you never get there. This is the point. This is why God tells us to seek his face. You can you can't see his face. Think about that. God tells you to do something you cannot do. Why does he tell you to do that? He didn't tell you to see his face, because you can't. He says, seek my face, which means it's a never ending journey of pushing yourself beyond your limits to get a little bit closer. It's happening right now. The Ashbury Revival. These kids in college are literally, if you go on YouTube right now, you go on YouTube at four in the morning, you go on YouTube, literally they're there 24, they've been in, in this chapel. They had a day of prayer and they have been in this chapel. I think three weeks, 24-7. They won't leave. They keep singing. I was like, this is, it is crazy to see it. Where you're like, wait a minute. It's, it, it's, it's two in the morning. Same people there. They don't have any drummers. They don't have a drummer. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Sometimes it's a dude with the thing. It's packed. This chapel is packed with like four or 500 people. People keep coming in. Bless the Lord on my soul. And then somebody gets up. I'm turning to the Lord. And then, yeah, they all, everybody happy. Right? And I was telling my wife, as we're getting ready to look at this, we're going to look at the keys to revival that the Lord gave me. But we had the, the privilege of experiencing something like that. My wife and I. We were on the USS Blue Ridge. Bear with me. And I turned my life back over to God. I didn't know if anybody was on the ship that was saved. From what I saw, everybody was wilding out, right? You can ask her. This is the, that ship was called is called the Love Boat because they just I mean, it's like girls always leaving getting pregnant on the ship and dudes is out there all these disease. it was just a wild ship. And I said, Lord, I don't know what to do. I don't have any friends that's going to walk. He said, save you some friends. I said, what? Save you some friends. So I had to go around and tell my testimony. Hey, uh, I'm a backslidden preacher, <laughs> right? Who leads with that? I started telling my testimony. The Lord ended up growing it. And people just, they came to just sit around to hear what I knew. 
and where I had fallen and what my life was like. And then they wanted to learn about the word. And then it was too many people to sit around that little table in the library. And he said, well, let's go to this place called the CTR. Come on, prophetess. You remember that? The CTR. I don't even know what CTR. Command training room, I think, is what it was It was called. And yep. we went in there, and everything started to happen by the Spirit of God. We didn't set a date. We didn't have a start time. We didn't have an ending time. I said, I'm going to be there at this time if y'all want to come. And they just started showing up. Sometimes nobody would. And then they started coming. And then so many people started to come. That the chaplain on the ship said, we need to, um, uh, I don't know why you do. I was like, I'm not doing it. He said, you can't meet in there anymore. So I would go and sit down to eat. And all the same people would come around the chair where I was eating with people. St- and, and tell us about this. And I tell them about it. And then eventually, the Spirit of God broke out and moved so much that we met every day for a year. 365 days. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? People who were just like, uh, I ain't into Jesus, are preachers right now, pastors, deacons. I was like, Lord, you moved. And ever since that time, I have been, and prophetess, maybe you have too, I don't know, but I've been searching for that. Yeah. So when y'all hear me talk about passion, I saw it where people were like, please, let's meet today. There was a power outage on a ship. We're in the middle of the ocean, dead in the water. And they were like, can we still meet? I said, we don't have lights. <laughs> they was like, we don't care. We just want to pray and see God's face. Can we go out and witness? Let's go out and pass out flyers and tracks on the, on the street. Are you serious? We saw God do miracles where it was a thunderstorm. And before we went out, they still wanted to go. When we went out, we prayed and said, God, we pray that the rain will stop until we finish passing out the tracks. The rain stopped. We passed out all the tracks. When I handed the last one, all the rain came flooding down. And the people knew it was a miracle. And then the joke around the ship was, man, if we had just asked the Lord to wait till we get back in the car, then maybe (laughs) instead of on when we pass out the last flyer, because our God can do miracles. Do y'all see that? And I see that same look. I turned on that that live and I saw it in their face. It's a different look than what I see in the eyes of when I turn on YouTube and see other ministries or even when we meet. It's a different look. I don't know how to explain it. It's that look of I don't care who's here. I don't care who's here. I'm only thinking about him. And if the pastor don't come, we're going to still meet. He's worthy to be praised. Hey, pastor, I I talked to somebody about Jesus. They got saved. I see it begin. We're like right there, but it's a look. And when that happens, God shows up and it's miraculous. So I want to look at a scripture, um, Matthew 3. I'm going to tell you four keys. Four keys to revival. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. Sister Sharon, you there? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Read that for us. We're going to read down to verse 12. Actually, you know what? Actually, don't worry about it. We'll read to six. Go ahead. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, Mm. Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair Mm. and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea. Then what? Then went out to him who? Jerusalem. Uh Uh-huh. And all all what? And all All of Judea. Judea. Keep reading. And all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. All of Jerusalem. That's the entire city, the capital city of, at that time, it wasn't a capital city. They were a Roman province. But the whole city of Jerusalem, all of Judea, 
That's pretty much the whole area, the whole region, and all the regions around about the Jordan. It was a revival. This is thousands and thousands and thousands of people, right? This is a revival. This is what I want you to see. Before he came and before God did the revival through John the Baptist, there was 400 years of silence. 400 years of man talking, but God not talking. Between Malachi, which is the last book or the last prophet to, to prophesy in the Bible, in the Old Testament, until the time that John the Baptist showed up on the scene, there was 400 years of God not saying anything. Nothing. But man was still, they were still doing their thing. They were still going to churches, to their synagogues. They were still worshiping. They were still going to the temple. There was 400 years of religious services, but no move of God. After 400 years of doing that, I'm sure that they thought it was a move of God. But in reality, it was just a religious service. <laughs> if you showed, if, if you showed Elijah what they were doing, he would say, what is this? Elijah moved by the fire of God, the power of God. If you showed Moses what they were doing at that time, he would say, this is not a move of God. When we were at the Red Sea, fire came down from out of the sky and God parted the whole sea. The whole sea parted before us. We're used to the fire of God, but we had, but now in the days of John, you have a generation that did not know the move of God. There was 400 years of no outpouring and it led to a dry and thirsty land where there was no water. All right. I want you to see it because we're in it today. Watch this. It was a it was a essentially a dead church led by dead leaders in a dead nation and only com God can revive death after that much time. 400 years dead. The Pharisees were dead. I hope y'all hear me. The Pharisees were dead. And they didn't know it. How do I know they were dead? Because Jesus looked at them and said, you are like clean sepulchers, which is a, a tomb. Outwardly, you're so clean and polished, but inside you're full of dead man's bones. What I submit to you today is that what the vast majority of us are calling a move of God is a move of man. It's a move of man. And the difference between a move of man and a move of God is the people respond in a particular way. When it's a move of God, the people's hearts change. When it's a move of man, the people whose hearts are already changed are excited. But that doesn't do anything to the community. That doesn't do anything to the people that are outside. They, they are unaffected. All right. So this is very important. I want you to see that. Watch this. What is revival? Revival is like an electric shock to the heart of a dying church. Revival. To revive someone. Are y'all seeing what I'm saying? <laughs> Reviving. When somebody is about to die, their heart. And you go in and you shock them until they come back to life but before you shock someone with the paddles you have to yell one word clear that means that the leaders and the preachers and the pastors and the people have to remove their hands out of what god is trying to do in the church and allow him to revive his people what i'm saying is foreign it is foreign today but throughout the American history, there has been several revivals called the Great Awakenings, where God's spirit moved and people who were racist and murderers and all of that changed just like they did right here in the days of John the Baptist. And we need one now. Watch this. God is doing one right now without us. 
Does that concern you? I don't know. It almost ticks me off. So I said, Lord, if I can't do it here, pull me and take me some, take me to where you are. I don't want to do it and be somewhere trying to make it happen. Lord, take me to where it is. I pray we might have an opportunity to see it because right now, as we speak, Kingdom Ambassadors is partnering with multiple pastors in Florida and we're getting ready to pray. Right here where our headquarters, we can't buy. Let me shut up. <laughs> we can't get us to pray because the leaders, we all got our hands in. I said, Lord, why does revival stop? He said, because of the preachers. The people will meet together. The people don't have a problem with coming together, but they're waiting on the pastors to be okay with each other to come. They are more committed to their pastors than they are to God. And because of that, my people who are called by my name won't pray. And there will be no revival without prayer. So the Lord said me to tell me to told me to tell you these things, then I'm gonna give you the four keys. He said, I'm ready to shock you back. <laughs> I'm getting ready to shock you. I'm ready to shock you back into true worship. I'm ready to shock. He's ready to shock us back into the supernatural. I'm ready to shock you back into seeing miracles every single day. And to seeing new, new revelations and new prophetic insights. The Lord doesn't want to just prophesy to one man or one woman. And everybody clap and say, oh, that's a mighty man, a woman of God. He's ready to speak to you. He's ready to speak to your children. The prophecy by the prophet Joel said that in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. And on my servants and handmaidens, I'm going to pour out my spirit, says the Lord. The Lord God said it to Joel. He started it on the day of Pentecost because when Peter, Kepha, which is Kepha, who stood up on, the, on that day, said it was prophesied what you see today by the prophet Joel. And the Lord is saying, I've been ready to do it for 2,000 years, but my people aren't ready. Just like the harvest is ripe and the laborers are few. The spirit is ready and willing. But there's nobody thirsty. There's nobody hungry. There's no nobody that wants it. Right? It's like, you can tell, let me give you a little bit. You can tell when the people are ready because they don't give excuses. They give reasons why they want to meet to pray. Can we pray? Can we all come together? Can we do it? It's good to pray one-on-one -on -one and you, with your little circle. That means nothing. He wants all of us. Hungry, hungry, hungry. Let me tell you something before I give you these four keys. I can, you know, one of my biggest, not fears, but things that I can't stand more than anything is to work at a place that has cubicles. <laughs> I call it cubicle death. That's what I call it because it's like, hey, John, what are you doing for lunch today? Oh, my. Well, at exactly 12 noon, I'm going to go to the same shop we go to every day for the last 30 years. <laughs> to me, that's cubicle death. I was like, just, just knock down the walls. If we could just, we could sit in the same room, just move the cubicles. Do you know what uh, another thing that's more, more fearful than that? Oh, we had a great service, didn't we, today? Oh, it was on fire. Content. Apostle, can we go and pray? Can all of us get together and pray instead of doing the same thing that everybody else does? Can we come in early? I know we got it from, can we come in two hours before the service and lay on our faces before the Lord and weep? I heard Leonard Ravenhill said that there needs to be, if he did a minister's class training, he said, if I had a seminary, I would give a class on weeping and then a class on wailing and howling how to scream out before the Lord and cry before the Lord in desperation because he taught that God answers desperate prayer. You can be praying until you blew in the face. That's what you're supposed to do. That's the basics. But he's looking for somebody that prays when you, when you don't want to pray. 
give you a two in the morning prayer when you got to get up at three in the morning and go to work. He wants you to sneak away and go to your car at lunch instead of eating because you want him more than you want your food that day. And say, even if I got to be starving and hungry, I want you, Lord. And he'll show up. The more you do that, the faster he shows up. And I have to say, I, I'm not, I'm not there. I'm not there. The people ain't either. Every once in a while, they click and they get on one accord randomly and he moves and every, he's, he's waiting so much to move that as soon as it happens, it starts to spread. It started at the Ashbury College and now it's moved to another college and another one. It's happening without us. Without us. And I said, just like that song, Lord, whatever you want to do in this season, just don't do it without me. I don't want to be away from it. I don't want to be away from it. I'm not going to be away from it. I promise you. I don't care if I got to get on a plane and go. <laughs> I will go where he is. I want to go where the flame is. So here are the four things I want to give you that the Lord gave me to you based upon this. The first thing that is a key to revival is we have to change our mindset. John came telling them to repent. Revival happens when everybody knows they need to repent. Everybody. Revival happens when both sinner and saint are not okay with their spiritual condition. You and I are in the wrong when we think we're okay. You're not okay. This, do you get what I'm saying? I didn't say you're going to hell. We are programmed to think heaven, hell. I'm on my way. I'm, I'm saved. I'm walking with the Lord. I love him. I, I, I read his word every day. Are you giving me a resume? Like that's what that's all God wants. He doesn't say that. There's no scripture where he says that. He just says, seek my face. The Lord wants you to draw nigh to him. And he will draw nigh to you. You never get there to him. You never get there until that day when we're in heaven. And even when we're in heaven, what makes heaven a place where we can never get bored is that we realized he is endless. There is no end to him that when you think you got him, you don't. That's why they could never classify Jesus. They tried to even right before he died. He said, who do men say that I am? And he said, some people say you're this. Some people say you're that. They didn't know. And he said, who do you say that I am? You've been with me every day for three and a half years. And when Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus looked at him and said, it's no way you knew that on your own. <laughs> because you can't, the only one that really knows who I am is my father. So my father in heaven revealed that to you. And just because you know it in that way, you really don't know me. How do you, why do I say that? Because the Bible says when they were around Jesus, that Philip said to him, Lord, if you can just show us the father, we'll be good. He said, how long have I been with you? When you see me, you see the father. I and my father are one. Do you understand that relationship? Do you think it's, it can be classified and codified with a word uh, like Trinity or uh, uh, oneness or whatever? You, you think you really know me. I am endless. I am from everlasting. And when we get it, we never get content. We say, Lord, I want more. Moses walked in the cloud with God. And when he went in there, he said, can you show me your glory? <laughs> and what did God say? No man can see my face. My glory is my face. <laughs> and live. He said, but because you pursuing me so much, I'll put you in a rock, put my hand over you and revealed my back parts. D Moses is the only other person that we can say in the word of God that saw the physical shape like his physical back. He saw his hand over him. He moved. Isaiah saw a shadow. He saw, but he didn't see it like Moses saw it. Moses saw it. How bad do you want it? And do you think that you, are you content with where you are? 
So what should be happening is when we say you need to repent, everybody has something they need to change their mind about. Lord, I haven't been filled with your Holy Spirit. I'm not cool with that. You said it's the earnest of our inheritance. You said it's the, you know how when you give earnest money on a property, you put money down. <laughs> the Bible says that that's the Holy Spirit is your earnest for your inheritance to show that you're going to receive your inheritance. Do you know you're going to receive your inheritance? Why? Because God gives you word and he talks to you through the scripture. That don't mean that ain't what the Bible says is your inheritance. The earnest of your inheritance is the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is the seal, the stamp that you are his. That's why when Jesus was in the water and he came up, the Holy Spirit descended like a dove and filled him according to Luke. And God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Speaking of the prophecy that he told John the Baptist, the one you see, the spirit of God descending like a dove, that's him. And when heaven sees the spirit of God come upon you and feel you, they say, this is one of the sons and daughters of God. All of us need to repent. All of us. Preacher and saint. Bishop, apostle. Think about that. When it, it's it's what happens in revival is when all of us realize this. I want y'all to underline it. That one key will will spark a revival like never before. When everybody from the least to the greatest actually realize that they're not okay, that none of us ever are. We don't make it into heaven by our works. It's not by how good you you're doing now that you that you that you are saved, but it's by his mercy. It's a balance. It's a, it's a balance between I know I'm going to heaven, but I'm not just satisfied with just going to heaven. I want to see him more. I want to see him save my family and whatever I got to do to do it. And then what, what's, what takes it to the next level is when you say, I just want him. You realize those of us who have been filled with the Holy Spirit knows that it is only happens when you come to the point where you just want Jesus. And then he says, hi, I've been waiting right here. <laughs> I've been waiting right here for you to do it. And if you can't get back, if you got filled before and you don't get filled, you never, ever, ever get filled. It's because you want everything else but him. But when you come wanting Jesus, pure, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith, my father, the pattern, my source, the one I came from, the one I'm going back to. Oh, daddy. Abba. Then he says, oh, son. And he said, oh, he's here. And I didn't know it. When all of us do that, that's when revival happens. All right, watch this. And that was my last point. Revival, be, re, revival means being with God is all that matters. Okay, my second point. The first one is change your mindset. The next thing that we see from this revival is you got to come out of your comfort zone. Look at the scripture in verse 5. And then went out to him, Jerusalem, Judea, all the regions about Jordan. Then went out to him. He did not go to them. They came to him. They came because God moved where John was. And it was because of his humility. Humility. I'm seeing that I, I kind of analyze this thing that they're talking about at Ashbury. I don't, there's no, I don't know who the leader is. They have multiple pastors that come up and will speak and say, one guy came up and said, I just want to tell you what's happening here. We had a prayer and God moved. Are y'all ready for God to move? Hey, Amen. And then they start singing. <laughs> and start words. He sat down just as fast as he got up. I said, well, is that the pastor? Who's the, who's the man here? Who's in charge? God is in charge. John was the leader, but he moved out of his way. He was in camel skin. He was Eden, but he was the lowest of the low of the low. And the people came out of their comfort zone. 
Revival happens when we sacrifice sleep for the Savior. Revival happens when rituals and routines are rejected for Jesus Christ. It will happen when we pursue God and not the preacher. I hope y'all getting it. When we chase the creator and not our church, when we weep in worship more than we want to go home. These people are weeping and they came out. They didn't matter if they had to walk hours. It did, they didn't have cars. They had to walk. They had to get out, walk in sandals. They didn't have gym shoes and nice shoes like we have now. They probably had kids. They had jobs to do. They might have worked all day, but they didn't give that excuse like we do today. I, I don't know if I can make it. It was a little snow. out. Don't you got a car? Yes. Don't you have heat in your car? Yes. Don't you have a, uh, the church is, has, uh, has heat, right? Yes. So then what are you talking about? Jesus prayed on a nasty ground. With bugs and spiders and stuff like that on the, the day he was getting ready to be taken captive. The Garden of Gethsemane. It's bugs and stuff everywhere. It's dark. He's praying in pitch black. On his face, crying before his father. We forget he would go to the mountain all night and pray. It's mountain lions. Danger. And he said, I'm going to be alone. With my father, we forget that when he went to be tempted of the devil, after he had fasted, he was climbing a mountain for 40 days. It took him all that time to climb the mountain. I have friends. We have friends who went on that mountain. They had to take a ski lift to get up there. And when they were up, they were traveling. They said he, he climbed this. He was tired and hungry. And then the devil came to tempt him. And he stood. How bad do we want it? Revival happens when your praise is in pursuit of God and your worship is re in response to God. I'm going to say that one again. That, get, that, that is coming out of your comfort zone. Your praise is the way you pursue God. And then your worship happens when he shows up. This is key, which means this. Today, we wait on the presence of God to praise him. Yes, we do. If I say praise God right now, <laughs> praise the Lord. Woo. If God shows up, oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, wait a minute. He wasn't worthy of that praise a second ago. When I asked you to praise him, you just said, uh. Matter of fact, some people don't even praise him. They just repeat you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Glory to God. Let him do a miracle. Let him get one of your family members off their deathbed. Now you're on your face crying and pleading before God. Revival doesn't happen because the people are waiting on God to do it when in actuality he's waiting on you to make a move. You praise him as a sign of your pursuit of him. And then when he shows up, it becomes even more real. But what we do now is give him a halfway praise. He recognizes it as being halfway and then he doesn't show up because he's looking for some true worshipers to worship the father in spirit and in truth, which means that when you hear the truth, you give him the praise and the glory and the honor because he's worthy to be praised, whether or not you feel his spirit or not. Oh, yeah. We wait to pray until we see God's spirit. No, I'm in pursuit. I don't need to feel you. I'm not, it's like if I'm walking towards my if, I, if my, if I'm a little baby and my dad steps back and says, come on, boy, come on, son, run to me. And I'm trying to get to him. I don't feel his arms yet because he's still away from me, <laughs> right? Most of us quit going after him because we haven't felt him yet. You feel him when you get there, when you get to him, you're in pursuit. So that means if you don't feel him, then that means you need to praise harder. You need to, oh man, I hope y'all getting it, right? I'm going to keep going. I'm pursuing him. I'm giving him what he wants, praise and honor and glory. You are made for praise. Your hands were made to lift, to clap. 
Your face was made to bow. Your knees was meant to bend. Do you hear what I'm saying? We were made. Every part of our being was made. Your mouth was meant to speak his glory and his praise and his honor. When you got a people that says, I'm not where I'm supposed to be, but I'm en route to where I need to be. And I'm going to scream out and yell and pursue and go after him and sing songs. I'm going to sing until you show up. He'd be like, y'all just so you just gonna sing. Yes, I'm gonna sing with all of my I look at the people that were that are at these little revivals and and like even with us, we would do revivals. We didn't have music. We didn't have any music. Think about that. We had a guy that had a guitar that came mid mid season. So for six months, we didn't have no music. We was singing old time songs, <laughs> new songs. One guy came because we were, you know, it wasn't all black. It wasn't all white. It was black, white men, just as many men as women. And we would sit there and this one guy, he came out of a, a Pentecostal church. I forgot that song he gave, but he he was like, he said, this is how it goes. And we was, it was so funny when he started because there's no music and he started singing the song. And then Mike Davis was his name, right? And, and he started singing this song and all of a sudden it became like our anthem. Right. And we would sing it every time we got together and nobody said, well, we the musicians is they they showing up and they not doing. They didn't care. God was there and he showed up and the people was on their feet. They some of them had to work that night, work all night. And they like, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, man, I can't wait. I'm just so full. And then come sneak away on their lunch break, which is at two in the morning, knocking on my little my little rack. Hey, hey, uh, hey, man, I got to talk to you about something. I uh, get to work in the morning. <laughs> That's me. And they're like, please, please. Jesus just revealed something to me. That's revival. Woo, hallelujah. When they're pursuing God more than the preacher, they just wanted to say it with me because they heard me say it. And we had three preachers that preached in succession every day. And then they quit. And then I just preached every day. Learned how to preach right there. You got to have seven sermons every week. Right. And they're like, well, how do you know this information? I had to study every night for the next day because we were pursuing God. The la my last two is, so the first one was we have to change our mindset. That's in the scripture. The second one is we have to come out of our comfort zone. That's what I was saying. And number three, we have to clean it all out. Clean it out. God is saying, I want you all and me, all of us, to clean house clean it all out inside outside philosophies mindsets clean it all out clean it all out how do i know that because they came and were baptized and that's one of the the the, the functions of baptism right he said arise and be baptized Washing away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. He's not talking about washing away your sins to be saved. The blood of Jesus does that. But the Bible says that the, that Jesus is he who came by blood and water and not b blood only. For it is the spirit that gives witness. But Jesus came by water and blood, the spirit, the water and the blood. When you repent, this is when the blood cleanses you because you have to be be repent and believe the gospel. When you are baptized, this is the water. And then when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, that is the spirit of God that agrees together to transform you that you may be revived and changed. But the Lord says, I don't some of you all do need to get back in the water who've never been baptized in the name of Jesus. However, some of you just need to come and be cleansed of the Lord. There are things, demons in some, this is what the Lord says. He says, some demons need to be cast out. Some generational curses must be broken. Some have ungodly things and acts that must be renounced. Some of us friends need to be removed. This is externally. Ungodly music needs to stop being listened to. Ungodly items need to be uh, uh, taken away and destroyed. How do I know that's biblical? The Bible says that there were many who had witchcraft books in the book of Acts, and they took them and burned them and said, we renounce everything that we did before previously in our lives because we must be sanctified. That word sanctified, is, it, the deep dive in it is hagamos, and that word literally means to be ceremonial clean externally and internally spiritually clean. He needs the house cleaned out. 
Jesus said when an unclean spirit has gone out of a man, the demon comes back and finds the house clean. When God casts the spirit out and removes all those things that are associated with the devil out of the person, we now have a clean house that is ready to be filled. It can either be refilled with the devil or it can be filled with God who is the Holy Spirit. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? He told them, come and clean up. Why? Because Jesus is coming. Oh, Jesus is coming. The king is coming. And they came, all of them out of Jerusalem. They came to be baptized. And the fourth thing that they did is they confessed their sins. Another part of the revival, which we stop in churches, but it is testimonies. Your confession is your testimony. That's why we confess our sins to God, but we also confess our sins one to another. It is your testimony. God brought me out of this. It is probably, this is one of the, I will say the second most powerful tool in maintaining the fires of revival. I hope y'all hear me. Well, no, I'm not going to say that. I retract that statement. I want you to hear me. I want you to hear me. But if you don't, Lord, send me to somewhere where they will. That's right. I want to go where I ain't say I got to be in charge. I'm going to always be a kingdom ambassador and your pastor. But you'll look up and be like, where are you going? <laughs> he on a flight <laughs> to somewhere. I need, I'll sit in the back. If God's presence, I'll sit in the back. Glory. Hallelujah. Let's sing these songs. I don't know. And just worship God. <laughs> I'll sing the songs. Take me where the revival, take me where the fire is. But look, what I'm telling you will start a fire. It'll start a fire right where you are. If you grab three or four people and begin to pray and really want and find out if they really want it too, if they don't want it, let them leave. Go to work. Bye. Get out of my face. Go. Enjoy mediocrity in Christianity. You're a part of the religion. You like mediocrity. I don't want mediocrity. I want the presence of the living God. And that requires something of me. That requires my mindset to be changed. That re requires me to come out of my comfort zone. That requires me to start cleaning. I got stuff to be cleaned. And as I'm cleaning, I'm telling my testimony, God is doing this in me. So I, I noticed that when they were doing their revival, when I saw the revival that we were doing, people, their testimonies go from what God did to what God is doing to what God is going to do. They started believing that if God did, did this for me, then he can do this for me. And if he can do this for me, then he's going to do <laughs> things in front of me. And then the people start celebrating what God is going to do like he just, like he did it already. And that is revival. That you not only over, overcome the devil and the world by the blood of Jesus Christ, but you also overcome it by the word of your testimony. Do you hear me? When you stand up in front of the people and say, God did this for me. God did that for me. He's doing this for me. I came out of this lifestyle. He saved me. He loved me when nobody else loved me. And he's going to fill me. I haven't been filled yet, but I believe I'm going to be filled with this Holy Spirit. And if I got to, do you see it? And the people rejoice because we all praise in pursuit of God. And that's when it's, it starts to happen. The look starts to happen in your children. They get a different mentality. You know, the closest worldly thing I've seen to that is the life of Kobe Bryant. Worldly example. He said, they said, you're a ball hawk. You don't pass the ball. Why don't you pass the ball, Kobe? He said, because I practice with these dudes. And they don't put in the work. When I want to stay an extra two hours, they want to go home. Oh, I hope y'all see it. When I want to get up at two in the morning and give them a call to discuss, they want to chill. Man. Talking about myself. Yeah. But it can change. It can change when we change it. God doesn't need to change. He doesn't need to repent. 
We need to change. We need to repent. We need to say, Lord, if you can do it for them, you can do it in our cities. You telling me Detroit doesn't need a revival? You telling me that Oklahoma City doesn't need a revival? You Oklahoma, the city of, uh, of, of, of Chicago and North Chicago don't need a revival in Tennessee. I mean, in Texas and Tennessee and all of these states that we they need a revival. And all he needs is somebody desperate enough to say, Lord, even if it's a miniature revival in my family, Lord, I'll take it. Even if you just show up in my room, I'll take it. I just need to come out of my comfort zone. I'm not going to wait on you to tell me how to come out of my comfort zone. I'm going to choose it. Okay, I hate to miss sleep. So guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to get up when I don't feel like it. <laughs> and go in there and get on my face. I'm going to call somebody and say, can you come on, let's covenant together. They pray at this time. I'm going to come in. If I'm here locally and we meeting, we, we meet an hour before for, for prayer. Make it where we got to come in at 3 o'clock for prayer. And we prayed for two hours before they showed up. Do you know how much of a difference we've seen since we started coming in an hour earlier and praying? When we stopped it, it was like hard. We started back praying an hour before, only maybe five or six people. Am I right about it? We got it from three until. And when you come in, get on your face. Go in, lay down before the altar. You get what I mean? Don't just walk in dead, Lord, we just thank you. Lord, we just, boo, boo. Heaven is saying boo. We don't praise like that in heaven. They don't praise like that in heaven. What do you think they praise like in heaven? How do you think when they call on the name of the Lord, do you think they say this, Lord, we just, we, we invite you. You know why we do that? Because we're waiting on him to be there. He's already there. <laughs> Where can I go from your presence? If I make my bed in hell, you're there. If I go to the east, you're there. If I go to the west, you're there. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You are already here. So now that I've shown up, I must bow before the king. I must give you all of my glory and my honor. Not this little pity pat like I'm almost dead. I'm always, I'm in a little cry. Lord, we just please. We thank you. He like, step up. Worship me. Honor me. I'm here. And then I will reveal, I will manifest myself to you. The God who was already there now reveals it tangibly to you. And you say, oh, I'm getting ready to take my praise to even a greater level. I pursue you with my praise. But then I worship you when you get there. I worship at his presence. I bow at his presence. But before he gets there, I'm running full speed. I'm fighting. I'm fighting through my flesh. I'm fighting through my tiredness. I'm fighting through the stuff that went through the week. And my oh, it was hard getting here. And I'm not used to praising. It doesn't matter. I'm afraid to be look like a fool in front of other people. Look like a fool. Hallelujah. How dare the king dance until he comes out of his clothes? How dare the king of an entire nation who, who literally has layers and rolls, robes up on him and people bow down before him now say, uh-uh, I'm before God. And he takes off his clothes and hallelujah, right? He praises it and loses his mind before God. But we are afraid. We give him our cliche praise. Oh, hallelujah. Woo. Glory. Whoa. Weak, weak, even in your quietness of praise, it can be with all that is within you. I'm going to stop it there. But I want to say this, this scripture goes on to say some other people showed up. The Pharisees and the Sadducees. But in verse seven, it says they came to see his baptism. <laughs> they thought that the revival was the baptism. The revival was the people's change of heart to come. And as a result of their change of heart, they knew they needed to be baptized to prepare the way of the Lord in their hearts. And this is why the people received Jesus, but the Pharisees rejected him. It's always us. It's always us, the preachers, the pastors, the leaders, because every time we show up, we got to be honored. We got to be glorified. 
And when we're glorified, God is horrified. God is not glorified when we are glorified. But when we turn it over to him and give him actually all of the praise, not figuratively, but actually all the praise, then he shows up. They showed up. And G- and John said to them, he said, when he saw the Pharisees, he said to them, you old generation of snakes, you generation of vipers, who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come. They were unwelcome because their spirits weren't right. They weren't coming to see Jesus. They came to see why was people getting baptized? Why are people going to this and not coming to my stuff? That's what they do today. But I don't think everybody is doing that. There is a movement that is happening. I was talking to a friend of mine. He said it at their Bible class in uh it's not uh, uh, it's a, a little a town Westland right outside of Detroit. He said they had been seeking God's face as a church. And at a uh, uh, Bible class, the spirit of God moved so greatly. They left at midnight. He said that was and he said, I was talking to him, what I'm saying now. He said, he said, it's not a coincidence. God wants to do a revival in our city. But the question is, what are they going to come to see? Are they going to come to see why this is happening so they can try to manufacture it? Or do you want to see Jesus? You generation of snakes, vipers who have, flee- who have told you to flee from the wrath to come. And he said, don't say we got Abraham for our fathers. Well, I'm going to put it in today's term. Don't say I'm a bishop and I came up under such and such. And this was my pastor and my overseer was nobody cares about who you're overseer. All men, all men who were born in sin, shaping in iniquity, who needed a savior like Jesus, like we all do from Jesus Christ. And he said to them, the ax is laid to the root of the tree. Watch this parable. Verse 10, read it for me, uh, Sister Sharon, and I'm leaving. Watch this. Verse 10, and now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Uh huh. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. All right, stop right there. I indeed- stop right there. Look at this. He said, I, all, he said, I am the axe. God is getting ready to cut down some trees. He's getting ready to remove Your old systems. They don't want revival. They want good services. They want lights, cameras, action. He said, I'm going to look at the tree. And if it doesn't have fruit, it's coming down. I can't speak for everybody else, but kingdom ambassadors, if he comes to our tree and he sees no fruit, he will cut it down. He will cut it down. We can have programs, leaves. We can have get together, leaves. The fruit is when you start seeing the hearts of the people turn to God. When they're looking, everybody is saying, I got to pursue. When you start seeing preachers and pastors come up and confess their faults, you don't see that. When you see people who've been in church all their lives, He was telling me, and I'm not going to go in depth, but he was telling me that somebody, well, they stood up and said it out loud. He didn't tell me their name, but at the thing, he stood up and one of the guys said, I have been struggling with this particular addiction. And I went to kill myself after our last service. Crashed my car into a a tree. Tried to kill itself. Singing on praise and worship. Nobody even knew. It's with the power of your testimony. He said, but after the fire of God and the, the move of God and the spirit of God convicted his heart at their event, he said, I know I'm free. I know I'm free. I know I'm redeemed. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go for that's the That's the move of God. Not when somebody says, oh, you preach so good. Good preaching is fine, but we want transformation. And he said, the ax is laid to the tree. I indeed baptize you with water into repentance, but he that comes after me shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And that's us, if we want it. So I'm going to open it up for questions. I'm finished. Let's open it up for any, if there's any questions. And then if not, we'll just keep it moving. 
Prophet is your dear. Yes, sir. Sorry about that. I don't, I see Brother Cheese. Okay, go ahead, That's Brother Cheese. I, I um, Apostle, you, you had went one through three. You, um, I don't know if you said four or not. I got all three, but I need the fourth one. So the first one is um, change your mindset. Come, two is come out of your comfort zone. Three, clean it all out. And four, confess your sins, which is your testimony. Okay. If we see people do that, we will see revival. Amen. But it got to be genuine. Don't just, I'm just, I get a, Apostle said we supposed to tell the testimony. You messed up already. Apostle said it. Apostle didn't say right. it. <laughs> I didn't say it. God mm -hmm. said it. That's what they did. That's what he told me to tell you. <laughs> so it's all about God. Not, not the apostle, not the bishop, not the pastor, not the, that if they come, that's fine too. But if they don't, you pursue God. You get with people and pursue God. Okay, anybody else, Prophet? Yes, yeah, Sister Nina. Go ahead, Sister Nina. Okay, you had uh, mentioned that it was 400 years between man talking before God started talking to them. Uh -huh. uh, it was between Malachi and you said the other prophet. I didn't get the name. Malachi, well, it's it's the between Malachi or the last spoken word in the Old Testament, Matthew. and and then I don't like to say Matthew because it's technically not Matthew; it's John. Right. It was between John the Baptist and the last time that a prophet was given to the land. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't see any. I just have something to say. Oh. Now go ahead. But I just have something to say about Saturday um, at church. Um, I normally I don't come there at any time around four, but I had to go somewhere and then stop by the church. But I tell you, they were pursuing God in the church. When I stepped in there, like you stepped right on the Holy Ghost. And you cried through the whole service. You just couldn't stop. But that's that was the Holy Ghost. You felt he was like he was waiting on me to just step in the door because it's like I stepped on him. And that's they was pursuing God in that church um, at that time. Yeah, and it's even mm -hmm. remember it's always um, the secret is I don't know how to say it. You celebrate what God did, but not too long. Don't stay there too long. Mm -hmm. The recipe for a dying church mm -hmm. is to talk about what God did. <laughs> Jesus said that to him. He said that to the Pharisees. They said, I am the, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Jesus said, you have heard that. He said, but God is the God of the living, not the dead. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? People love to tell me, oh, man, your dad did so great things. Jesus mm -hmm. did great things. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he used my father. But if my father didn't respond, if he turned away from him and went the other way, became a black Muslim, they were moving in Detroit at the time he was preaching. Malcolm X and them would go outside of their churches, right? When he was a pastor in 68. Or not, he started pastor 68, but before that, he was a, he was a preacher. He could have joined the nation of Islam. He could have did whatever. If he didn't respond, God could have, would have raised up someone else because it is God. It's not the my father mm -hmm. who served God. It was the God of my fathers, mm -hmm. the God of Abraham. It's my the God of Abraham. God. It's the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Right? That's the key. So if he did it in their day, I don't want you to repeat what you did in their day. Lord, what are you doing right now? I don't want a monument. I want a movement. And you're exactly right. God did do it. And we celebrate him for it. But when we say to him, Lord, do it again. <laughs> what do you want me to do again? Whatever you want to do. You don't have to do the same thing. You can do it. Because that's why Jesus never healed people the same way twice. You know why? Because somebody would have rolled down here to three steps. <laughs> to healing a blind man, number one, you got to spit on the ground. You be like, I don't want to be, I don't want to be healed of blind. You keep putting all this saliva in my face, right? And then you got to do that. So he did it different.
because oh, that's okay. what they would do. Lord, teach yeah. us to heal. Teach us to pray. He said, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. seek me, seek me, seek me, seek after me. Yeah. All right. Every once in a while, y'all, I know y'all wonder, why does he always come back to that message? Passion. It's the key. It's the fuel. If you, ha if you are on fire now, your fire can go out. Yeah. I don't care who you are. I don't care how long you've been serving the Lord. You are on fire. If you have bad uh, uh, tendencies, True. a tendency to not move forward or a tendency to just move forward in God's word mm -hmm. only, you will die. That's the fastest way to die. Why do I say that? And I'm a word guy. I'm a guy that believes in the word. But the Bible says mm -hmm. that those who get that word and go only in the word, they become puffed up. Cause they know I learned mm -hmm. something. Oh, look what I learned! It, it's a two-edged sword, and it'll kill you. But if it's it, if if you take the sword and give it to the Holy Spirit and mm -hmm. allow Him to fill you over and over again, you will build yourself up in a way that you've never done it before. And there's some people say, "I'm filled with the Holy Ghost." Really? If you ain't been filled like they was filled. <laughs> and the Bible said this is what happened when everybody got filled, but you got filled a different way. I'm sorry, let God be true. And every man a liar. I didn't call you a liar. Notice what I said. The word says, let God be true. <laughs> and every man a liar. I used to think that, oh, yes, I'm filled with it. Until I got filled. Then I said, oh, no, I wasn't. I did not have this. Whatever this is, give me some more, Lord. I went back and tried to do it the same way. Watch me. Watch me, y'all. I'm talking about what I'm saying. This is the history. Lord, oh, you feel me this way. Do it again. I, I think I was holding my hands like this. I was literally doing that. And the Lord says, you know, that ain't how it works. What do you mean? You got to pursue me. Well, how do I know how to pursue you? Ask. God, what do you want? I'm attentive. I'm looking. I'm watching. Oh, he gave me a word. I, oh, thank you, Jesus. I'm and he sees it and he says oh he wants to worship me in spirit and in truth <laughs> he shows up and he fills me again and then i come back again pursuing him more i'm not content because i got filled you content you got saved no, I want the joy of my salvation. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Renew the right spirit within me. Let me be overflowed by the waves of thy billows. This is what Psalms is about. My cup needs to run over. The only way the cup runs over is to leave the faucet on and let it keep pouring and pouring and pouring and let it just bubble over. And that's the, that's the secret. It's the secret mm -hmm. that he don't want to give you a drop. He wants rivers. Not one, not two. Remember LeBron James, how many rings he was going to win? Not one, not two, not three. I want that many rivers just flowing out of me. And people mm -hmm. always will come up to you and say, ooh, you're just doing so great. And the first thing I say is, praise the Lord. Tell me I'm lying. Everybody who ever said that, ooh, I love that word you said, praise the Lord. You think I'm saying I'm agreeing with you. I'm saying we have to. The moment I start thinking this, I'm smelling my sauce. Yeah. Yeah. It'll collapse. Hallelujah. Maintain it. All right. Who's next? We'll do two more, I guess. Brother Richard had a question. Go ahead. Go ahead, brother. <laughs> it was more of just saying how I'm just so thankful of um God's um um confirmation. Um for the past week or so I've just been feeling very unsatisfied with where I'm at. And and it's, it's, it's just confirmation now to push me to go even further. I remember the first time I felt <laughs> unsatisfied in my spirit, and that's when he took me to a different mindset, which led to, a, to just a whole different me. And um, I'm at that feeling again where it's like it's somewhere he want to take me, and I'm not satisfied where I'm at. I want to seek him deeper. I want to see him. And, I, and when you have said – um. Keep seeking his face. He never says, see my face, but seek my face. Right. And you just hit it right there, man. That was just, that was like, it make, it gives you a different perspective. And um, also it just humbled me because when you was talking about Jesus and um, the things that he was doing, when he climbed the mountain, when he was tired, when he was hungry, he was being mm -hmm. tested, he kept going. He didn't falter. 
And it just broke me down because it's like, man, I'm nowhere near my king. It's like at the level that he's at, like I just I, I can only pray and to, to seek to be the way he was mentally, physically, spiritually, in all ways and every capability. And I just look towards that perfection. And it just keeps you humble, man. It's no, no matter what you've learned, no matter what you got, it keeps you humble to know, like, like you said, I'm, I, I'm, I'm still not there. I still haven't arrived. You know, right. I'm just saved by grace. I ain't saved by my works. It ain't uh, nothing that I did to get to this point. So it's just, I'm very thankful for this message. It was confirmation. And, um, yeah, I'm just appreciative of it. Praise the Lord. Always be repenting. Always be changing your mind. Yeah. What he says, we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. If you don't think it needs to be renewed, we think renewing of our mind is just the reading of the word of God to get more renewing like the knowledge of the mind. That's not what he's talking about. It's the mind that needs to always be changing towards God, towards him. Does that make sense? I need to repent. I need to repent every second. And, and we just think of repentance of our sins, but repentance of not Going, having faith, not seeking his face as much. Lord, I need to go more. But it's a balance because you don't want to blast yourself. That's not what we're saying. We're saying, Lord, oh, I want to push. This is where you want me to go further. It's a it's a CD. It's not even a CD. It's old. It's a tape called Revival Fire. You remember that, Prophetess? Mm -hmm. Revival Fire, yeah. the Brownsville Revival. It's a revival in Brownsville, Florida. And... uh Leonard Ravenhill and some of the other guys you hear me talk about, they were on there. There's a there's a part where this guy said, I was he was a pastor. He said, I was sitting, his name is Steve Hill. He said, I was sitting on the front pew of the of the church one day. He said, our services were packed, hundreds and hundreds, if not a thousand or so people, right? And he said, he said, I screamed out, God, there gotta be more. It has to be more. He said, I couldn't stop screaming. I screamed it out. Nobody was in that church. He said it was empty. The, the lights was dim. Nobody was there. It was a regular weekday. And he said, God, I'll die if there's no more. If this is it, I don't want to be here. There's got to be more. And he said, and the Lord looked at him and said, don't give up, son. There's more to me than you can think. He said, I jumped up and got passion and fire. He said, I didn't care what what any what happened to anybody. It's a story, just and I'm gonna go to Sister Jerese, where this guy named Tommy Tenney, he wrote a book. Uh, I forgot the name of it, God Chasers. He said he went to a service and the presence of God was there. The musicians stopped playing and started to weep. <laughs> The, the people started to weep uncontrollably, and it was a sound that rose up of weeping and praising mm -hmm. at the same time. And then the pastor went up there to speak, and when he went up to touch the microphone, it, it was like a thunderbolt hit the stage. Boom! Knocked him back. He fell out, un literally, not like, like off his feet, in the air, falls, boom, unconscious. They rushed the stage. To check on him, he's unconscious under the presence of God. And, and he said when he was sitting there, it was like the Lord let everybody know, when I'm moving, nobody touches my glory. I experienced that very briefly in a sermon that I did at a church here in Detroit where the people started to weep while I was reading the scripture, not preaching reading the scripture, weeping uncontrollably. And then the youth, all of the young men and women jumped up and began to scream and praise God. And we couldn't finish. Yeah. And the Lord says, I want to do things and you're in my way. I'm yelling clear. I'm ready to revive my people. But y'all in my way. Mm. I pray it happens again in our, in our sight. I pray it happens again and I say, go ahead, Sister Jerry. Now, I just want to say, I was tr trying to, um, like Brother brother Washington, this was timely. Um, just this today at lunch, 
uh, I was telling somebody, I said, yeah, I said, when, you know, people say they're saved, it's almost like they think they're playing a baseball game. You get to the home <laughs> base and you run costs. I'm good. <laughs> right. And that's it. But it's more like what you were talking about with the, um, the baby. If the baby got up and just walked to the mom or daddy once, like, woof, I did it. I know how to that's- walk. <laughs> right. No, you right. right and and i was thinking in terms of like myself i'm going i think i have been trying to work my way in do you, do you, do you know what i mean like yes. if, okay well if i do this and then then okay yeah and then i'm gonna <laughs> do that and all these things and it came to me the other day i woke up <laughs> And I started listening, and I, and I listened all day at work, in the car, grateful. Yeah. Hezekiah Walker's grateful because grateful. when he created this earth, we didn't have to do nothing. Nothing. He gave it to us. There was no covenant. That was that. It was all given freely. Yes. And so I'm trying to walk that, that, and it's a it's a constant. Yes, it's a constant. I, I, I yeah. But it's a constant towards him. That's all he wants. It's only him. You in a you in a room full of just two people. You and God. I pray that our mindset changes to that. But nobody can change it but you, and me. I can only change mine, and you can only change yours. And when we change our minds and we come together, supernatural things happen. But those four things, I wanted to give it to you from God. He gave it to me. He told me. I said, what do you want me to tell him? Because I have, you know, I get, I can come up with and bring some stuff to you. But I don't know. Change your mindset. Everybody, sinner and saint, needs to not be okay with their spiritual condition. You're not there. I'm not there. Right. I'm not there. You're not there. There's something we all need to do more that God wants. Come out of your comfort zone. Do stuff that you don't want to do to get to him. Clean it all out. God, I need to be cleansed. Every last one of us has stuff we need to be purified from. I want to be cleansed. I'm not leaving day after day after day, every day until you cleanse me completely out. Then I'm coming to you confessing my sins and I am going to tell my testimony as you what you've done, what you're doing, and what you're gonna do. When we all do that, woo, when we all do that, God will say, Uh oh, I got a people that really want me. Cause when he sees the people that he really that really wants him, he shows up every time, every time, every time in the book, every time. So that means what we're doing. They were holding services all 400 years. <laughs> I want you to get that. They were sacrificing in the temple. They were in the temple every day, three times a day for 400 years. And no word from God. Nothing from God. It wasn't him. They thought, but look, they thought it was. Mm-hmm. Because what they were doing, they were excited about it. And then they were, you know, we follow certain principles. When praise, when we praise, the Lord inhabits our praise. So we'll feel his presence. But it ain't nothing like a revival where you like God is transforming me. He's doing it in my children, et cetera. So, look, that's all I have. I've We've gone kind of long. But I wanted to tell you that. Amen. 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 Lord God, we thank you. I pray, Father. I pray that you will just continue to do it, Father. You're doing it. You're trying to do it in the United States of America. There's so many that have been praying for revival in America. And I believe that you're doing it now, that you're doing it in this season. And Father, I pray that we can be a part of it. I pray that I can be a part of what you're doing in any way that my life can be revived, that my wife's life can be revived, that that you would save people in our family, that you would revive them. So many great, so many great preachers, so many great people. Father, we pray even that the people who have gone astray and walked away from you, Father, that you want us to be, if the righteous would scarcely be saved, the ungod- where would the ungodly be? They would be on their faces before you, Father, in repentance, just like we are. 
But when they look at us, they see somebody that they can't attain because we put on a facade, we put on a mask as if we're perfect and flawless. We are nothing without you. All of our righteousness is filthy like dirty, filthy, stinky rags. And we wear them proudly as if we've done it. But it is not by the works of our righteousness that we have done, but it is according to your mercy that you saved us. You gave us righteousness, imputed righteousness, yes. that we can put on the new man and take off the old man. And they can too. But if we don't tell our testimony, nobody will ever hear. If we never tell anyone that I was this, I am this without him. Without him, I'm right back. But he sustains me. He keeps me. He keeps me until the day of Jesus Christ. He can keep you too. Yes. And when they can hear it from somebody other than the man or woman of God in the collar and all of that stuff, Father, you just want the people to come out of their comfort zone, come out of our, our we're not safe in our comfort zone. We're one breath away. We're one heartbeat away, one heart stop away from eternity. We're never safe. We always must be going forward and having an edge as one that lives and teeters between physical life and death, that we're not afraid to give it all up for you, Lord Jesus. And we're going to fight the kingdom of darkness until the very end. We're not content. Let us not be content. Give us the heart of warriors that are not content, but ready to go to war for our king. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let us have a great and safe day. Amen. And Father, we pray also for the weather for in all of this, the, the uh, states. We thank you for keeping the Bulls family safe. And we ask you to uh, keep us also safe as this winter storm is coming into Michigan. That we can still come forth and worship and the people will be transformed. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. 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 We covered we covered Texas now.